It's so good to be here with you again today to open up God's Word together. And when I say together, this is the best way to travel this journey of this message. Um, I'm telling, I'm going through four stories, and for you to locate these stories in your own Bibles, as you hear this message, it will be, uh, it'll be so much easier to go through it. Uh, because I'm just going to touch on the high points of these stories and for you to have those stories that you can read in your Bibles as we go through this, it'll fill in the, the spaces for you. Before we get started, let's join our hearts in prayer and ask, uh, Father, can, can you just come into this, this space right, here, right now? Take full control of all that I am for your purposes right now. That you can speak into the heart of each person listening right here, right now. By your Holy Spirit, I'm surrendered before you now. Thank you, Father. Amen. We want to take on a, a subject today that can be formidable. Well, I want to talk about fear. You know, Fear, the words do not be afraid, is actually written in the scriptures about 365 times. <laughs> it's amazing, eh? Uh, one time for each day of the year, it says do not fear. And there's many more times uh, talking about, um, about do, do not fear. And different variations of that is added to it. So there's so many times scripture is saying, do not fear, do not fear. When an angel appears in the Old Testament, do not fear. In the transfiguration, and, and the disciples are freaked out. What are they told? Do not fear. So uh, this is uh, when, when, when the heavenly realm is interacting with this earthly realm. It is so incredible. There's, there's a condition in man that is fearful. And... It's like the scripture saying, there's no need for that. Don't you know who your heavenly father is? Why are you afraid? So this is something we want to go through today. And to, to do this, uh, there are four stories that I want to go through. Now, there are, like fear is a, is a terrible thing. It's, it's a thief. Uh, fear robs a person of many things. I just want to touch on four areas today that fear will rob you of. Um, you know, fear, if you take it as an acronym, F-E-A-R, you could say false evidence appearing real. Fear. Because there is an element to fear that that is unnecessary. Um, yeah, sure, there's, there's some basic fears we teach our children to respect a hot stove, for example, or, or don't just run across a busy street. There's, there's some fears that, that are, are useful for respecting the risks around us. But we're not talking about that kind of a fear today. We're talking about a kind of fear that can paralyze you, that can just, that can just uh, rob you of your productivity and leave you doing nothing. We're talking about a kind of fear today that can, that can steal from you your potential and leave you stagnant, not becoming all you are meant to be because there's a residual fear there holding you back. I want to talk to you today about a kind of fear that, that just zaps your strength right out of you. It'll rob you of your power. That kind of fear. And then finally, the fourth kind is the, uh, a fear that, that steals from you your sense of posture. And we're going to talk about these four things. And I found in Scripture these, these four stories that illustrate these four points. And I want to go through them quickly and, uh, and to keep up and to understand these four stories. Please find the passages that I give to you and you can locate the whole story in, in the Bibles. And even as you review this message, you can press pause and you can... Um, review the story, look at the, the context, and, and, under, and get into these four stories. They're, they're so full of, 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 of meaning. Well, 
to set the, the tone for, for why we're, we're dealing with this issue of fear, let's turn to uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 15, where we read, For you did not receive the spirit of adoption, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Now the term Abba can be translated daddy. It's, a, it's an enduring term. It's, a, it's an intimate term, a, a term that presumes a deep knowing of who that person is, a daddy. You know how, how your daddy smells. You know how your daddy laughs. You know, you know how, what makes your daddy upset. You know, it, there's, there's a deep knowing of who your daddy is. Well, fear is a, is a thief. And um, these four stories... Um, can take us through these four areas, stealing your productivity, stealing your potential, stealing your power, and stealing your posture. So let's get into the first one. If we look at Matthew chapter 25, the end of that chapter, then we see this story of, of a man that's going away. Jesus is telling this parable, and, and he, he's giving some talents to, to, the, to the, his servants which is like uh, uh, some money, and saying, I'm going, I'm going on, a, on a trip, and when I come back, we'll, we'll settle up these accounts. But here, I want to give you each some money to do something with while I'm gone. Well, we know the story, um, you know, different ones are given different amounts, and they do something with it, all which produce increase, right? Uh, but there's, there's, there's this one guy that, that takes his talent and goes, digs a hole, and buries it. And, and when he... When the master comes back and says, what, why, why did you bury it? You, you could have at least given it to the bankers and, and received some interest back from it, but why did you dig a hole and bury it? And, and, um, and this is what we read from verses 24 and 25 of Matthew 25. Then he who had received the one talent said, came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man. Really? He just, he just gave out all this money, you know, without any strings attached. Uh, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. There. There you have. There you have what is yours. This man, did he really know the master at all? Obviously not, because the master shows his character when he comes back from his trip and he richly rewards the ones that brought and showed increase by giving them so much more proportion to what they had done. That's not the heart of a, of a master that is cruel and scandalous and, and evil and, and a thief. No. Obviously, this talent that was hidden and buried was done so with a man that was so gripped with fear that he was paralyzed from taking any action at all. Have you known that kind of fear? Because that kind of fear steals from you and paralyzes you, steals your productivity. We're not brought into Christ just to sit and wait for heaven. No, there's a lot of work to be done. And this work is a kind of work where God flows through us and there's, our hands are, are, are set in motion, and, and the body of Christ has much work to do as we speed up the, the coming of the Lord by our own productivity. And we can't do this if there's fear holding you back. So this is something that, that has to be dealt with. Now, the solution to this fear, the kind of fear that steals your productivity, is really simple. To know the Master. See, the other servants knew their master enough that they were willing to take the risks because they knew the master was a good man. If they made a mistake, their neck was not on the line. They knew who the master was, and so they took the risks, and they produced an increase from that money. This man, the barrier, didn't know, and this is what we need to do. We need to know him. John, the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 10, we read, the thief does not come except to steal 
and to kill and to destroy. And this is Jesus saying, I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. This is the, the, the master that, that we need to get to know. Well, the second item, uh, the, uh, the thing that fear just steals right out from under your nose is, is our potential. And there's a great story to illustrate this from Matthew chapter 8. And I'll be reading verses 26 and 7. But if you go to Matthew 8, you'll see the story of, of going out into a boat. And um, Jesus is, uh, is sleeping in the boat. He's tired. And it's night. Have you ever been out in the water at night on the lake, a big lake? Or the ocean at night and the storm comes up, it can be a scary thing, right? So, so the, the disciples are, are freaked out. Um, they, they wake Jesus up and they say, Master, Master, don't you care if we're perishing? Like, like help! It was a panic. Help! Coming out to them because Jesus is sleeping and, and, and they're panicking and they're trying to figure out why is he sleeping and, and so they do what makes sense to them in their fear is they wake him up and ask him to save the day. Well, that's where they were when they went on this boat trip that Jesus saved the day. Jesus worked the miracles and they followed him. But that night, you see, Jesus had something else in mind for them. Why else would he be sleeping? I mean, he, he wasn't just laying there pretending to be sleeping. Jesus was sleeping in a storm. Why was he doing that? It was so that the disciples could stretch. They could step into their potential that night. Uh, what does that mean? Oh, well, just think about it. What would they have done if they didn't wake Jesus in a, in a panicked fear? What would they have done? The boat's sinking. The waves are coming in. They're in the middle of a lake. It's dark. What were they afraid of? Well, drowning. Drowning is a terrible way to die. Okay, but Jesus is there. Hadn't Jesus called them to be his disciples? Wasn't Jesus talking about the kingdom of God coming and, and these 12 would be, would be an, integra, an, an integral part of building this kingdom? So if that's who Jesus is and that's why they were called, then uh, would they be dying and everything come to a stop? I mean, would, would, the whole, would Jesus' whole plan and whole prime directive be cut short because of a boating accident? No! So what if they did drown? Well, Jesus, would Jesus drown also? Well, I guess if bleeding out on a cross would take his life, then uh, being deprived of oxygen in, in a drowning experience would also take his life, right? And so, so there's. But wouldn't there be resurrection on the other side? Wouldn't, wouldn't there be in the morning? their lives restored and go on. And what a story of a death and resurrection could have been theirs if they wouldn't have awakened Jesus. Or, or what if they, they, um, the, the boat sank and, and they go down with the boat. Uh, what could have happened that night? Uh, what, if, what if as the water came into their lungs, all of a sudden they were breathing water somehow like, like you know, fish with gills breathe? What if, what if all of a sudden they, they had this experience? I used to have this dream. It was a recurring dream, the strangest thing where I'm drowning and all of a sudden I, I can't hold my breath. So I take, I take a breath, in comes the water and all of a sudden I'm breathing water and I'm going around in the, under the water like, oh, I guess I have gills now. You know, it's, it was the weirdest dream. And uh, what if God worked a miracle and then they, Jesus with the disciples, their, their boat has sunk and they're walking along the bottom of this lake to the shore, looking at each other like, wow, what an adventure. It could have been a huge um, stepping into their potential in, the, in, this, in this eternal realm, which is greater than time and space 
which is the heavenly realm that we're called to. It could have been, but fear kept them back. Fear kept them from standing up and rebuking the waves like Jesus did. Jesus just woke up and said, be still, and everything got quiet. Why couldn't the disciples have done that? Was that, was that faith not in them to do it? It's not, it's that they didn't know who Jesus was because when Jesus did that, what was the response that you read in the story? What did they say to Jesus after he calmed the storm? They looked at each other and they said, whoa, who is this guy? Even the wind and the waves listened to him. See, they didn't know who Jesus was. And that was why the fear was there. If we want to, to break free of the kind of fear that, that, that keeps us back from our potential in Christ, that stagnates us where we are, that keeps us in the rut of where we've been, if we want to break out of that, the only way to is to come to know Jesus, to know who he is, and to know who we are in him, and to know who he is flowing through us. This is how to beat that fear. So as we go on, um, fear uh, can steal your productivity. It can steal your potential. Um, uh, it can also steal your power. It can steal. Have you ever been so afraid that the power, that the, that the strength just drains from your body and you have no energy, no, no strength? It happened to me once. I love telling the story where I'm, I, I'm 17 years old. I, I, I see this big silo on, on a farm and I look at the top. It's got to be 75 feet up and, and I decide I want to I climb that silo. Oh, what the view would be like there. And all it has is it, it has this rebar coming out like a U out of the concrete for, for the step. There's no, there's no cage around it. It's just these rebar coming out. So I thought, oh, how hard can it be? So I, I, start, I, I start climbing up the silo, and when I'm uh, maybe three quarters of the way up, I'm almost up at the top, I start, I look around. And it was the weirdest feeling, the fear. I was like, I couldn't hang on anymore. I had to take my arm and, and loop the elbow over this, this rung because there was no strength in my hands to hang on. And I had to hook my, my elbow on in order to, to, to not fall. And I gathered my wits and, 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 and focused, you know, just looking at, at the rung, not anything else. And I was able to, rung by rung, climb my way down. And it became an experience that just baffled me. Why did that happen? Whoa, what kind of a fear was that? zapped all your strength right out of you. Well, Peter experienced that kind of strength. This was some time after the be still on, you know, to the waters uh, adventure. And, and they're on, on the boat again, and it's, it's really stormy. And, and there comes Jesus walking on the water. This time Jesus doesn't start out in the boat sleeping. Jesus is having a stroll on the water, walking to them. And... Uh, they look and they think it's a ghost. It, it, it freaks them out like so much. Um, uh, Matthew chapter 14. Um, Matthew chapter 14 is where this story is. And, and so um, Jesus says, hey, it's, it's me. And Peter goes, if it's really you, then and tell me to come out and walk on the water to you. Right? Okay. So... What's, what's Peter thinking? I mean, last time they were in this situation, Jesus said, just speaks, be still, and everything calms right down, right? So I'm sure he's probably expecting something similar, right? So he, he steps out of the boat looking at Jesus, and, and it's happening. Okay, so, but he's walking on the water, but the storm doesn't subside, so it must have been like a, a roller coaster ride with these waves just going up and down. It's like, oh my, and, but he's on the water. What do you think Peter's thinking? What do you think he's doing? Well, if I was Peter and I had just been in that situation where Jesus is saying, be still to the waters, 
and they're thinking back. Maybe they talked about it as a group, saying, well, you know, Jesus was saying, like, I re- why, did, why did I rebuke you that night? Well, why didn't you do what I did? It wasn't that hard, speaking to the waves. Don't you know who I am? Well, maybe, maybe Peter was, was walking on the water saying, like you say to a dog that's, that's, you know, like jumping on you, down boy, down, down, down. Maybe he's, he's looking at the waves saying, be still, still, still. But he's looking at the waves, trying to, but trying, but his power goes. He's looking at the waves and, be still, still, and he's sinking. All the power drains from him because of the fear that's in him as he's looking around. You see, we can't make little formulas saying that when this happens and you say that and that happens. Life in, in, in the presence of God is not like that. It's a life of connectivity with him. And every day is an adventure. It's a winding road. You don't know what's around the corner, but he does. And so you listen to his voice and you keep in step with him and you look to him. If Peter just would have looked, looked to Jesus, he wouldn't have had that fear. But he didn't know, and he didn't know what was happening. He didn't know who Jesus was. And so this fear totally stole all of his power from him. And then uh, we need to, to, to look again at this verse from John 10.10. 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. And Jesus says, but I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Fear, the thief, steals productivity, potential, your power. What about your posture? And for this story, it was, uh, I, I saw it as we are reading through our, our, our Bible reading, our systematic reading that some, many of us as a church are, are doing. And in the book of Jeremiah, uh, chapter 42 and the 44, this whole series, you see this incredible um, saga being played out. Nebuchadnezzar has conquered Israel and he has set up sort of a puppet king for him, Zedekiah who will do what he wants. And so Zedekiah is the king over Judah. And, and the, he has his own Chaldean um, presidential guard around him, uh, men of war uh, to protect him. And so um, he is Nebuchadnezzar's arm uh, in, in Israel. Well, Ishmael, this guy, says, you know, this is no good. We want our autonomy. So, so he rises up and he kills Zedekiah and all the people around him, and including the Chaldean men of war that were protecting him, he kills everybody, and, and he's brutal about it. He, he, he throws all their bodies in an open pit, and, and he's just like a bloodthirsty, uh, out-of-control uh, rebel that's, that's going around. So this other guy, jo- Johanan, comes in, and he kills Ishmael. And now Johanan is representing the remnant of Israel, the people that are left after this captivity. And uh, he comes to Jeremiah and he says, look, you know, we, we want what God, God's best. And we, we, we want to hear from God what we should do. Now, meanwhile, they're thinking we need to be going to Egypt because look at this bloodbath. Oh my, when, when Nebuchadnezzar finds out that his guy and his protection detail have been killed, the, the army's going to come in here and, and they're just going to level this playing field. They're not going to discern who did what. They're, we're, we're, we're toast. And so they just want to run for their lives and run to Egypt. And, but, they, but, but they're smart enough. They come to Jeremiah and they say, Jeremiah, what does God say? So Jeremiah uh, goes to God and listens and comes back with a word from the Lord. Jeremiah says, whatever you do, do not go to Egypt. Stay here and the Lord will take care of you. If you go to to Egypt, everything that you're afraid of is going to happen to you there. Okay. So he delivers this word. And uh, what does Johanan and all of that company do? They don't listen. They go to Egypt. This is, this is what we read in Jeremiah 42, verses 21 and 22. Jeremiah is saying, 
and I have this day declared it to you, but you have not obeyed my voice, but you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord your God or anything which he has said, which he has sent you by me. Now, therefore, know certainly that you shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence in the place where you desire to go dwell. Now, what do the people respond to Jeremiah? This is a couple chapters later in Jeremiah chapter 44, verse 18. They say, but since we stopped burning incense to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, the, the idolatry which has put them in this pickle in the first place, uh, we have lacked everything and have been consumed by the sword and by famine. You see? What was it in, in the people's hearts that were keeping them so stiff-necked and stubborn? They, they had tunnel vision and, and fear was, was keeping their posture in the direction in, uh, that they were not supposed to go. And they were, they were, they were bent on, in that direction. Jeremiah and the word of the Lord was trying to say, no, don't. Come, come and change your posture to a, a bowed posture. To, to humble yourself before the Lord and to say, yes, Lord, amen. We will comply with your word. A humble posture. But no, they were stiff-necked and stubborn. And they were going to go to Egypt and, and they were preset. Uh, th- them asking and hearing the word of the Lord was just a pretense to see if the Lord would, would agree with them. And, and, and fear does that. Fear does that because they were afraid of famine. They were f- afraid of the sword and they were running to Egypt for safety. Fear gave them tunnel vision uh, according to what they saw and observed. And, and what the Jeremiah was saying was that God, you can trust him. He's outside of time and space. And, and he will look after you here if you stay. But they couldn't see that. They couldn't see it because they had tunnel vision. Fear does that. Fear is the essence of terrorism. And Satan is the original terrorist. Fear is merciless. Fear is the original symptom of sin. What did Adam and Eve do when God called to them in the garden after they had disobeyed? They were hiding in the bushes, hiding in fear from God. And this is how we tend to hide from each other as we hide from God. We hide from the things we don't know, like the dark, uh, like COVID, uh, like, like public speaking. We, we hide from things that we don't know. Um, and we, we hide because we don't know what others are thinking. We, don't, we hide because we don't know what's there if we can't see it. We, we hide when we hear conflicting reports Uh, and, and fear takes over. But perfect love casts out fear. Uh, why? Because in love, there is a knowing. Why does it say in scripture uh, where Adam knew Eve and, Adam, and Cain and Abel, they, they were born? They, it, it's describing the, the, the sexual intimacy as, as knowing. It's a term used in the Bible. Well, if you think about it, there is a, a great wisdom to that. The, you young people, you should never, should, should anyone have access to your private body uh, if they do not first know you, know your likes and dislikes, know your pet peeves, know your history, know your goals, know the trajectory of your life, where you've been, where you're going, who your parents are, how you've been raised. All of this is part of the, the knowing that culminates in marriage. And with that marriage commitment, there is this, this, this ah, where the fear dissipates and you can be vulnerable. Now, now lust, it has the power to overcome that fear, but, but lust is a terrible taskmaster and it destroys the human psyche and leaves the human soul broken and injured, uh, and, and it, 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 it's terrible, the carnage that lust is doing in society. But, 
But with real knowing, there is no fear. The rebuke of Jesus in the boat to the disciples that day is, is because, yes, they lacked faith, but, but it was, uh, they didn't know him, which is by faith. Um, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Inasmuch as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself shared likewise in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who, through fear of death, the disciples in the boat, uh, Peter, uh, Johannan, uh, uh, who fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The primary symptom of living in this world estranged from Christ is fear. The only way to live free of fear is to know him. May this prayer be our prayer as we read in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17 to 20. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Not academic, but experientially that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what that you may know what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, that you may know what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Now, on our church website, there's an 11-part series, a preaching series, entitled Knowing God, in which our pastor opens up this, this invitation into this deep personal realm of knowing God. And this is uh, uh, the highest recommendation to, to take the time, maybe in your commuting time, to, to tune in and listen to this series on our church website by our pastor entitled Knowing God. There are so many names by which we could know him. But the effect of not knowing him, settling for what you know about him, doesn't cut it. It doesn't break the bonds of fear. You can know about God. I mean, Satan knows about God. It doesn't do him any good. But when you experientially know him in his word, in the body, in in his presence, and yes, in the furnace of affliction, knowing him is a life free of fear. The kind of fear that that wants to, 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 to rob you of your productivity, rob you of your potential, rob you of your power, and rob you of your posture. That kind of fear is gone. And we're able to take risks. We're able to live abundantly. For Jesus has said in John 10, 10, I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. Fear strangles that abundance. It leaves you deprived and and, and alone and and in scarcity. Uh, uh, Knowing him brings you into the wealth of his realm, of his person, of his character. Let's join in prayer. Father, thank you so much for this word that you're giving to us, a word that can, that can break the chains of fear in our lives, that can, that can motivate us and inspire us to, to seek you diligently, to actively break apart all idolatry that would, that would simulate you, that would misrepresent you, and just come to you, Lord, Oh, Lord Jesus, we want to know you and the power of your resurrection. Oh, we understand we, that when there is no resurrection without death. And so we're going to go through stuff, stuff that kills us, it seems like. But we're not afraid of death. You've conquered death. You've brought us into life. Oh, Lord Jesus, bring us into you. For you are life. You are truth. You are the way. 
There's no one that can come to the Father but through you, and we want you. Lord Jesus, we want to know you. We want to know you intimately. Thank you, Father. Work your will in us. Work your way in us. Work your truth and work your life in us as we come close to you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.